Hello, I'm David Judson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Stratfor. With me today is George Friedman, founder and chairman of Stratfor. George, thanks for joining me today. Pleasure. Um, what, I mean, it's a, geopolitically, it's a busy time in the world. We've got crisis in Eastern Europe um, sort of easing up and a crisis in Iraq that seems to be potentially deepening. Before I get to the second crisis, I want to talk briefly about the first since you're just back from a, a grand tour of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the, even for a Texan, a month on the trail is a long time. Uh, on, that, on that point, you've been talking, before you this last trip, you've been talking and writing for some time about the emergence of a new alliance structure in Eastern Europe, um, the intermarium. Um, that's kind of a foundational term. Uh, where does that come from, intermarium? Well, the term itself comes from a Polish general and founder of modern Poland, uh, General Pilsudski. And he was dealing with the same geopolitical problem uh, that exists now. He had a Russia, a Soviet Union, uh, that was in the 1920s increasingly assertive and pressing on his frontiers and the frontiers of the rest of Central Europe and the whole Central Europe now. Behind him, he had a Germany that at that time was uncertain, unclear of his intentions. But Poland had emerged from World War I with these two empires clearing the way. So his question was how to preserve Polish independence. And he had really two strategies since he wasn't strong enough to defeat him. One had somebody from the outside guarantee their security. And that was France for him. And, but he didn't really trust that this was going to be sufficient. So he imagined an alliance that ran from the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea, including countries like, at that time, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Romania, to Bulgaria, possibly Turkey, but and that this group would serve to contain Russia and would have, instead of an east-west orientation, a north-south orientation. And it was something that never came to pass and it never gelled. But when I started thinking about the fact that Russia was reasserting itself, was going to be reclaiming its priority within the former Soviet Union and be pressing on them, and the fact that Germany was once again uncertain as sort of thing, I thought this might be something that would emerge. And in a kind of very early proto stage, right. that seems to be what's happening. So from what I understand from what you, the, the columns you've been writing recently, you see the, the, the idea is most advanced perhaps in Poland and Romania with the Czechs um, a bit nervous and other people kind of scratching their heads around this. Uh, Still a hope that um, that you know the existing NATO infrastructure will will serve the purpose. Well, this is the point. Does NATO really serve a purpose? Right. And one of the things that was interesting in Europe was the disjuncture between how the people on the frontier, as they call it, the Eastern Europeans, uh, felt, and how people to the rear, uh, Spaniards. I mean, for them, this was a very distant non-crisis. Right. Uh, Ukraine mattered. It was unacceptable, they would argue, the way the Russians behaved. But it was nothing that threatened their national security. The setting on the alarm for a Poland or a Romania or any of these other countries are much lower. They, they see the Russians as capable of much more aggressive behavior. So necessarily the Poles took the first step in calling on NATO to act, but also took the second step in reaching out to Romania, the other large country, and the one on the Black Sea, to begin having intense conversations with. And in fact, there were intense conversations between Poland, uh, Romania, and even Turkey. So they looked to the United States, not the rest of Europe, as their guarantor, and they looked to each other as the alliance. So is America, I mean, in a mood to, to be the guarantor the same way that they would like the United States to be the guarantor at this point? Is that well, let's distinguish between the mood of the United States, which right. is always manic depressive, and look at American history. Right. 20th century was all about the relationship between Germany and Russia for the United States. Mm -hmm. When the Tsar fell in 1916, uh, in 1917, I should say, uh, the United States, weeks after, Intervened. 
Uh, they stayed out of it as long as they could out of the war, and then they sent a million men. The United States really got deeply involved, not in the periphery of the European Peninsula, but in the European Peninsula itself, in 1944, late in the war. But one of their goals was to limit the Soviet advance into Germany. And of course, the Cold War was all about Germany's relationship to the Soviet Union. Germany was divided. Uh, the fear was that it would be amalgamated because a Germany allied with, united with Russia is an enormous combination of capital, technology, and natural resources. It is frightening to the United States. Now, there's the mood of the president and of the assistant secretary of this or that. And then there's the underlying geopolitical reality, which is the United States really cares about this. And so somewhere between President Obama's reluctance and the pressure of history, he went to Poland, Vice President Biden went to Romania, and they both made commitments of very limited sort, right. but significant steps uh, in guaranteeing their security. So when we have this new security political architecture, the the, the proto intermarium if you will, um, emerging on, on one side of the Black Sea, moving eastward, we've got this new emerging or re-emerging, perhaps is a better word, crisis with the temporary collapse of Mosul and the evaporation surrender of the Iraqi army in their first confrontation with the, uh, the insurgent group and a lot going on that we're trying to understand. Are the points of intersection between these two crises? At the moment, there doesn't seem, except there's this much. The Russians have to welcome the crisis in Iraq because the United States had an almost laser-like focus on the Russians, on the Ukraine, on the Eastern Europeans uh, over the past few months. Now the Americans have to be looking at Iraq. Uh, Iraq seems to be on the verge of being divided between the Sunni region right which ISIS, the group that's doing this, would dominate. The Shiite region, which is moving into an even closer relationship with the Iranians, and the Kurdish region. So you seem to be having a situation where the government is losing control over the countryside. Now, we can't overdo this. There's a tendency to see everything as apocalyptic. What has happened is a very carefully coordinated campaign by relatively few troops on the part of ISIS. Uh, against Iraqi troops that appear to be unmotivated. To the north are the Kurds, who have the Peshmerga, their own forces, about 40,000, it's said, and they're quite powerful and don't like this insurgency. In the south, you have the Shiites, who, backed by the Iranians, could cause any number of problems. And in the end, the United States has not yet said that it was going to intervene in any way, shape, or form, but has made it clear that it guarantees, in some way, the Baghdad government. So, as we speak, right. the situation is unclear, but certainly the ISIS group has made it clear, made its presence known yeah. in definitive terms. I suspect that we have many rounds to go and many evolutions to take place, but the intersection, not really except that anything that diverts the American attention pleases the Russians. Well, we'll have to leave it there. A lot more to talk about and a lot more to pay attention to here at Stratfor, which we'll be doing. Thank you, George. Um, thank you. Thank you.